Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where it is you're connecting in from today. Thank you very much for taking time uh, out of your day to come listen to us talk about uh, Storyboard. My name is Scott Snyder. I'm a product marketing manager here at Crank Software, um, and I will be your host for today. And of course, uh, today's uh, session we're going to be talking about is basically preparing Storyboard for a Linux environment. And this, of course, is part of our ongoing series, which we conduct uh, usually around the end of every month. And it's really about uh, advancing your knowledge and increasing your, your depth of, of awareness on the different capabilities that Storyboard brings to the table uh, to really help you uh, with developing your UI for your embedded products. So today's session is gonna be recorded. And so that way, uh, if at any point in time you need to drop off or perhaps maybe uh, you have a colleague that you think would benefit from today's session and wasn't able to join, then definitely they would be able to kind of pick it up by registering for this particular session. Of course, uh, any point in time, if you have any questions uh, that you'd like to get addressed, please submit it within uh, the question chat section and we'll, at the end of today's session we'll be uh, be addressing all questions that do come in and of course I like to say at any point in time if you, if you like to kind of throw some stuff out there on any of the social media uh, platforms whether it's uh, Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook always uh, feel free to use the hashtags of either crank storyboard or embedded uh, GUI with that being said, your main speaker today is going to be uh, Nick Schultz, who is a field application engineer here at Crank Software. He's been at Crank Software for uh, five plus years and has been in the embedded world for a little bit longer than that and has a wealth of knowledge from performing a variety of different uh, roles uh, within the embedded industry uh, over the, the last five plus years. So like I said, today's agenda, we're gonna be talking about preparing storyboard for Linux deployments. And so we're going to be kind of, uh, I'm going to provide, provide a little kind of a brief intro in the storyboard. And then right from there, I'm going to hand things over uh, to Nick. And he's going to jump in and start talking about, you know, what it takes to connect to a Linux board. You know, some of the differences uh, between the different Linux configurations you may have. And, you know, maybe some tips and tricks on how to determine the best runtime for Linux. Uh, and then, of course, uh, discussing uh, SCP and uh, APP and uh, addressing whatever questions that uh, you may have that come up from today's uh, discussion. So let's uh, kind of quickly, uh, you know I, know, I know most of us probably are quite familiar with Storyboard, but again, I just kind of kind of remind you all that, you know, definitely, you know, what makes Storyboard different is that it's not a code generation framework. Uh, really, it, it's, you know, having um, the, the coupling that front-end UI from the back-end logic, and then having that well-defined kind of data model uh, an event API in between really helps provide that clean separation between UI development and of course hardware deployment, uh, really allowing your UI that you're creating to be uh, more flexible to any type or more resilient to any type of design changes that, uh, that may occur. So whether it's you know, changes in the physical design itself or maybe changes in hardware or OS, a part of your technology stack uh, that you may need to, to change at at any point in time. Uh, and definitely, you know, uh, Storyboard brings to the table some really unique features that, you know, no other kind of uh, UI development platform brings to the table. And that's things like graphical compare and merge, which really allows you to be and remain in control when you kind of need to make those changes, maybe from a UI design standpoint, that to kind of allow you to go through and, 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 and pick and choose. As well as we we really work closely with vendors, whether it's people like uh, NXP or, or ST Microelectronics, to really ensure that the Storyboard engine, which is kind of the, the 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 secret sauce of it all, really takes advantage of specific board features, whether it's proprietary graphic libraries, uh, 2D or 3D hardware, um, hardware acceleration, and of course uh, different memory management capabilities. The other thing I just want to kind of call out, just to kind of help you advance your awareness. So if you know if you haven't been there yet, definitely if you're looking for additional information, we have uh, recently revamped our help center and support center. And so we have a variety of getting started videos. Uh, we have uh, knowledge-based articles, which include both text and videos as well. 
Um, we have a downloadable demo image section where, you know, things like maybe today's uh, files that Nick uses, we will be posting there for you to access after the fact. So if you do go back to the video and you want to kind of follow along with it, you could have access to it from there. Uh, as well as access to our communities where you can go in and, and post questions uh, or provide answers to other um, like-minded folks that are really looking to kind of, you know, maybe kind of advance their knowledge or, or looking for help on how to maybe do something specific within Storyboard when creating their UI. So with that being said, I'm going to pass things over to Nick. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Scott. I'll. Uh take over screen sharing uh, shortly here. There we go. Perfect. All right, so you guys should be able to see my screen here. Um, so I'm gonna quickly pop out of the slides and uh, bring us over to a storyboard environment. And as Scott mentioned, I, I suspect most of you are already familiar with storyboard, the platform and sort of, you know, the general workflow and what we're all about. So I'm not gonna spend too much time there. Um, but we will start out in in the tool and uh, you know importing a sample app just to uh, you know give us something to start with. But after that, a lot of it's going to be focused on you know the Linux environment, how to make sure everything's set up and, and ready to go. And for this demo uh, and video, I'm going to be using uh, an evaluation board from NXP. It's the i.nx8m Nano, and there's a demo image available on our website that you can download. So if you're looking to uh, reproduce the steps that I have uh, that I'll be doing today in front of you, you can do that as well. Um, so the first thing I always like to do, you know, we open up the storyboard. It's a, you know, fresh, clean environment. You've got all your links to your tutorials, your documentation and um, the support center. But, you know, we're just going to go ahead and we're going to import one of the samples that ships with the product. Um, you know, so if you played around with the tool, you've probably seen this before. I'll just stick with the address book for now. And, you know, this will provide us a pretty good uh, basis to, to play around and, and test with. So while you're building up your apps, you know, in, in the, the storyboard environment, you're always focused on, on building the user experience and the user interaction. You know, you're not really thinking too much about the hardware specifics since we do a very good job of uh, abstracting that away so you know as you're building the user interface you don't really have to worry about you know what the operating system is or, or what's happening underneath it you can just focus on you know getting the design and interaction right and you know while doing that you know you might play around you've built up some concepts you know if we simulate our application you know we've got our nice little address book here with some of our favorite uh, Game of Thrones characters there and um, you know we can go through Get rid of ones we may not like, add a new contact, all that sorts of fun stuff. And, you know, once we're happy, we've um, built up this content, we've seen what we've, we've built here, you know, it finally comes time to run this on the embedded hardware. And up until this point, you know, we haven't really had to worry about any of that. And, you know, for the most part, you still don't have to know too much about, you know, what's going on behind the scenes if you're developing an app. But in the case of uh, running on a Linux board, you can, uh, you know, there's a few things that will that will come up. And, you know, the first thing is you, you need to understand how do you export your application for the embedded system. And uh, if you've ever done any of this before or read through some of our docs, you're probably familiar with that. But the first thing we want to do is sort of come up with an export configuration. And this is where, you know, you can start to define the, uh, the configurations for different platforms. So maybe you're evaluating a couple different boards and you need to, um, you know, set them up. So we have a little button at the top of the toolbar here called edit export configurations. And this basically allows you to pick and choose your assets that you want to export and deploy. Um, you know, the format in which everything is, is going to be exported and build up multiple configurations. Right now we have, you know, a single default configuration, which, you know, mirrors quite closely the, uh, the Linux configuration we're going to use. So, you know, we could, we could use this if we wanted to, but, you know, we can go ahead and create our own here. So I might say, you know, I, IMX8, 
say OK. And then if we select that option there, we can start manipulating the content. For now, I'm going to leave all of this uh, set up since you know we are exporting to a, an operating system that has a file system, so we don't need to uh, do anything that might be more MCU specific. But you can also go through and, and cherry pick some of the assets that are going to be coming with it. So by default, we, we export everything in our project, but maybe you only wanted to uh, send a few of those elements down or you've got some, some things that, you know, maybe you're, you're not keeping for deployment, only for, you know, debug. So perhaps scripts or something like that, you could include or exclude them in this view here. Simply close that. And you know that maps directly to the project view on the left here. So if ever you're you're wondering, you know, where something is, or if you create a configuration, export some content, and maybe some images aren't showing up, you know, you can always cross-reference, you know, the content living here in this project versus what uh, gets deployed on your embedded system. So now that we've uh, we've created our, our resource configuration, we can go through and, and start. You know, doing the the export side of things. You know, what what happens when we launch our application on the desktop environment with the simulate icon is that we are actually executing uh, our runtime engine built against the desktop platform. So in my case, a, a Windows desktop, and I have access to OpenGL acceleration and hardware. So we're we're using the the runtime built against that platform, and the, uh, the, the tooling actually exports this, um, this application behind the scenes and sets all that up for us. So, you know, pretty lucky here, but we know at least when we simulate it, it is the same embedded application. All that being said, you know, if you're poking around and curious to see how it's configured on your desktop, this is where the information is going to show up. And this will roughly mirror the command line options we can use on the embedded hardware. So, if ever you're curious or if you you know, enabled some feature with logging, say performance metrics, and you're curious how that, how you might translate it down onto the hardware, you can take a look at it here, as well as um, check it out in our docs as well. That being said, we're not looking to run it on our simulation environment anymore. We want to stick it out onto the embedded hardware. So this is where we open up our uh, application export configurations panel. And this is where we want to set up how we're going to export and, and uh, send our application. So the default packaging method is the, the gap file format. And all that does is when we run the exporter, we are going to convert this GDE file into an embedded um, ready file to be interpreted by our engine. So I'll select that, but you can see we have other options available here. APK for Android, uh, C, C++ resource header for a MCU package, but uh, stick with that. This is where we can select our resource configurations, you know, the IMX8, and we can also choose if we want to transfer this somewhere. So in this case, because I've got my embedded hardware running beside me, and you know, I'll quickly swap over to the webcam so you can see what that looks like, but uh, right here we have the option of doing an STP transfer or uh, direct file system transfer. So if I were to stick with the file system, that would export the, um, the gap file into the project directory under the navigator tab that we saw earlier. But for now, I'll stick with SCP. I can use my previous options here, you know, the IP for the board, and I'll show you how to get all that information shortly. But if I were to now uh, switch on my webcam just for your benefit here and I'll hide the desktop for a moment just so you see the webcam full screen. Perfect. Now I'll try and get both of them into the picture here so you can see the, uh, the embedded hardware we have over here, uh, our demo application running. You know, I can you know, click a couple things, navigate through. You also see we have an IP address showing up there. So if your hardware has a uh, Ethernet jack and is configured to run the Ethernet uh, stack on, on your Linux configuration, it'll auto display the IP address, which is super nice and helpful. Uh, but I'll just load one of the other apps here. So you can see here we're launching one of our medical applications. It has some uh, you know, trends, graphing, things like that. 
jump back out of it. And now if I were to hit the apply and run buttons on the dialog I had open earlier, so apply and run, we're going to SCP the application we had onto the embedded hardware system. And from there, since it's SCP, we can then, you know, go into the system and um, you know, launch it and run it. So you saw on the, the embedded end, we've sort of shut down the, the app that was going. And um, we can start playing around with that shortly. So I'm just going to quickly close down the webcam here. So now that we've SCP'd the application over, we can uh, start poking around the embedded system. You know, so I, right now I've I've SCP'd it, but you know we're going to go through and we're actually going to manually run it from the embedded hardware. But if you were to uh, you know download our demo image from the uh, from the web and auto start it, you could do an SCP and run. And you may have seen in my configurations, you know this is where if you'd like to execute a script after launch, you can you can leverage, leverage that. The first thing you want to do is you want to get a connection to your embedded hardware. So in this case, the first thing you might want to do is open up a serial connection. You know, most boards these days will also, you know, if you have Ethernet, give you the option to do a um, SSH network connection, which is a little bit more um, usable in some cases. But in some some pieces of hardware, you may not have that, or you may not be close to an Ethernet jack. So you'll want to connect over serial. Now, each board is going to have specifics around, you know, the baud rate and, um, you know, how they expose themselves. So, you know, that's one of those things where you'll have to check the documentation around surrounding the hardware to understand what's, um, what, what's going on in, in terms of the specifics. But, you know, in this case for the IMX8, I know we've got the, um, you know, two, two COM ports that show up. We want to select the highest one. The, uh, the lowest COM port is going to be a, um, a serial connection for the embedded MCU chip that's on the board as well. So we'll select that. Our, our baud rate or speed is 115200, uh, pretty standard these days with uh, you know, 8 bits um, for the data and all of these. So I'll select OK. And if we hit enter there, you can see we're greeted with a login prompt. And the default login for most embedded boards is root. And uh, sometimes it might prompt you for a password. It's likely that password is root as well. So we're on our embedded hardware system now. And you know the first thing that we always, I always like to do is you know run if config, and that simply you know prints out the Ethernet information. So you can see here, you know our IP address, which matches what we were displaying on the uh, on the display. The second thing is you know there's obviously something happening on this board you know you plug it in you flash an sd card and it, it auto boots into a, a nice crank demo launcher with a couple different apps and if you're curious to know what that looks like you know you can see here under user crank that's where you know we keep all of our our content and our assets and if i list the directory there you can see we have a apps directory a runtimes directory SCP and then the storyboard underscore SCP launch script. This, um, you know, is what we we're going to use to uh, remotely launch an application. And you know, if you poke around under SCP, you can see here some of the files uh, copied over. And I think uh, for some some reason my uh, my exported GAP file didn't, didn't copy over over the network there, so I'll just try and redo that again in the background. Hmm. Strange. Well, we won't worry too much about that, but uh, that's where your content can show up if you're looking to leverage some of our SCP launch and deploy functionality. We also have the storyboard uh, SC key script. So if I were to clear this terminal, make it a little bit larger for you. And oh, there we go. 
you can see here, this is the script that we have launching here. Uh, a few things going on here that are somewhat board specific. So, you know, things around the uh, cursor blink lines and these values, but really the most important thing to understand from, uh, you know, your end when you're looking to configure your board for an embedded Linux system is, you know, we export a few environment variables. The engine itself is looking for um, SB underscore plugins. That's going to give us the, um, you know, the path to any of the plugins and the LD underscore library path. So these are the two uh, main environment variables we're going to be looking for. And you know, when I try to launch some things later, you'll, you'll see what's going on there. And, you know, some systems might require, require some other ones. So in the case of the system running a, a, um, a, a Wayland environment, and in our case, the Weston compositor, you'll see a variable like this. But really what's happening is, you know, we've exported those paths. We have our, our engine and the path to that is, is called out here. So when we run our application, we call the engine. So under the bin directory, SB engine, we pass in a series of options. So in this case, you know, we simply tell it to run full screen. And in this case, the path to the application. If I were to uh, launch that from the command line and come on here, so crank, we can call storyboard SCP and then pass in, you know, a path to the, the application. Now, for some some reason, my address book didn't didn't copy over, so I'm just going to use one of the existing applications on the um, on the board itself. So under apps, we have, you know, OpenGL Nano and the, uh, the gap file is located there. So 1280. And if we see there, we've launched it. I'll quickly switch to the webcam so you can see. There we go and we've launched the application that was, was running on the board. So that, you know, obviously there, you know, the, the script is already pre-configured, so there's a few things that are that are handled for us, but, you know, those are the, the main things you need to do. Now I'll go into a little bit more detail and explain some of the other things shortly, but I just wanted to show you, you know, the, uh, how quickly you can get an application up and running on your hardware. I'll quickly switch back to my display. Perfect. So if I, you know, control C that, that'll, that'll kill the application in the process. The other uh, directories here, so again, I mentioned there's the apps directory. This is where we have some subdirectories underneath. So we have, you know, the, the launcher, the robot arm, the vitals, crank up. And so there's existing applications there that you can play with and poke around with. Each one of these folders contains that exported gap file as well as the GDE. So if you wanted to uh, you know, re-import that into your design environment, you could copy that off the board. So using something like SCP or um, you, know, you could uh, put a USB drive into the board if you have a USB connection, that works as well. Or maybe even uh, configure FTP or mount a remote directory. So there's a lot of different options available to you. But these, these apps live on the board and uh, be poked around with. The other directory that's important is the runtimes directory. In this case, we only have one runtime that lives on this board, and you can see here it's labeled um, Linux, IMX8, Yocto, OpenGLES2, Wayland. And basically, the name of this directory determines the configuration of the runtime, and you can use, you know, that naming to help understand which one you want to pick. In our case, we we know a lot of that is determined by the hardware. So for instance, you know, the first piece that you're gonna see in that title is Linux, right? So that determines the operating system. If we look at our installation directory for storyboard, we ship a large number of runtimes with the product. And these are all built and configured for you know, a lot of common evaluation boards 
out on the market. You can see the majority of them are, are Linux based. Right at the top here, so we've got Linux for some of the IMX6 boards um, that support OpenGL ES. There's also ones that if you don't have hardware acceleration or maybe the system image you're running doesn't have the OpenGL libs configured, we have a pure software based rendering version that can work as well. It's also worth mentioning that the software renderer will work on systems that are fully OpenGL configured too. So, you know, you can sort of uh, use the software as that lowest common denominator, but whenever possible, it's always great to leverage uh, OpenGL hardware. You can offload your CPU and allow it to do a bunch of other things, which is great. IMX8, again, what we're running here, this runtime here, so, you know, operating systems Linux, the hardware platform, IMX8, OpenGL, and it's using Wayland. We also have a runtime that makes use of, you know, just the raw um, OpenGL interface. So if you don't want to run the Wayland um, system, that's totally fine there. And you probably, some of you probably know what Wayland is. And if some of you don't, you might be wondering, okay, what, what is Wayland? Wayland is a uh, screen managing stack. So, um, if you uh, think of a desktop scenario where you've got programs that are running in their own windows, Wayland is a system that helps you manage applications as their own uh, screens or windows. So you could in fact run uh, multiple storyboard applications in, in windows and um, use the Wayland system to build up some window management functionality if you wanted to. Usually Wayland is um, you know running with a, a compositor. Most of the uh, embedded systems that have system images built are generally using the Weston compositor. So if you're ever curious about that, there's a good chance that if you're just on the target and you start typing Weston, you know it'll autocomplete here. And there's a, a bunch of other simple applications. So if you're ever curious, you can try running um, you know the Weston Flower app. And if I quickly switch on my screen again, or my webcam, perfect. You can see that we have a nice little flower uh, popping up on the display and you can drag that around. And that's, you know, one way to test and understand if you're running uh, Weston. Swap back here. Kill that off. And then the configuration information for uh, Weston is under the etc directory, init d, xdg, there we are, Weston, and there is a ini file here. So if you are running Weston, it does uh, a lot of the, a lot of the work for you. It handles touch input, it handles the display configuration. So if you are, um, you know, wanting to rotate the display, you can modify that config file and flip everything 180, what have you. All that being said, you know, we sort of talked a little bit about, um, you know, what, what the different Linux systems offer, but, you know, once you know your hardware and you have a system image, that's when you can, you can pick your runtime. So in our case, we know we're, we're running with, with this particular runtime, but maybe you've got uh, one of the community boards like a Raspberry Pi, you have support for that as well. Um, other operating systems you can see down here, QNX, uh, UC Linux, Embedded Windows, they're all supported as well. Um, all of these runtime directories contain the plugins. So one of our environment variables that I called out earlier is simply pointing to this list of plugins. And these are the features and functionality that your application will leverage at runtime. So in some cases you might want um, you know, mapping some input in if you wanted to connect the mouse, you know, that's where this devin plugin lives. Um, also, any of the 3D pieces and functionalities with the Lua scripting environment are all handled there. And that brings me to another interesting point where, uh, you know, the touch environment, now depending on what system you're using and what configurations you're using, uh, Linux generally has, you know, two main touch libraries. They're called TSLib and MTDev. And if I jump up a directory into the non-Wayland runtime, since you know Wayland handles the touch input with the Western compositor, but in this case, 
you can see here we've got this plugin for MT Dev and also a plugin for TS Lib. Generally speaking, um, MT traditionally TS Lib was um, sort of single touch input, and then MT Dev was multi touch. Now TS Lib is, has newer versions where it supports multi touch, uh, but out of the box, MT Dev is usually a little bit easier to configure and get up and running. Of course, it always depends on what libraries are available on your system, but a good way to you know, quickly check without actually searching for the libraries is if we go back to our command prompt and if we look at the storyboard launch script again, you can see here, you know, we, we, we have some options here. We can increase the verbosity and it'll show us the plugins that are loading and if any of them fail to load, we'll understand, you know, if libraries are missing or not. So if I were to modify that using BI, I can just drop down, I can add some levels of verbosity to the engine. I forgot my dash there. So this, you know, adding four Vs, you know, increases the diagnostic output. Each V adds another, another level. And this is generally kind of a, a sweet spot if you're looking to understand what's happening to the engine at runtime. You can, uh, you can do that. So if we were to launch the application again and oops apps gl you can see a lot more information has popped out on the console I'll fill that off quickly but if we go all the way back up to the top this is where you can see you know plugins and, and if they're loading or not generally you know this is where Whoops, uh, I'll run that again for you, sorry. An SSH connection is probably a little bit more uh, useful to seeing information that's printed out diagnostically. But this is where you can see detected the plugins. And if you go down, you can see there is the, um, so you can see here with TSLib, we don't have the libraries for TSLib. So that's a pretty good clue that, you know, TSLib isn't really an option uh, on this system in its configuration. In terms of MT Dev, you know, again, find that uh, a little bit further down in the, in the list, and we don't see any errors around here. So if you wanted, you could you could leverage MT Dev. And when using that, you know, since you know we don't have uh, much information about the touch device right off the start, you're going to have to do a little bit extra work to to hook that up but it's pretty easy to do. And the first thing you need to do is you need to detect your um, touch device. So on our system, we've got a HDMI monitor with a USB touch connection plugged in. So assuming you know, you've got a standard uh, system and everything enumerates and displays properly, your device is gonna show up under the dev directory. Under dev, there's a bunch of different options, you know, system devices, but for us, what we want to do is look under input. So input, and this is where we have, you know, a number of different devices popping up here. And whenever you add something, so generally, you know, if you're connecting it via USB, it's going to pop up here and, um, it'll be enumerated generally based on what it is. So if you were to connect a USB mouse, it's likely you see a, a mouse um, zero or one or two or three device popping up. Same thing with keyboards. Um, some, some systems, I know I've seen some older Linux systems where touch screens didn't come up as you know, touch screen zero. They came up as an event device. So it always makes sense to try and you know, understand which device is actually uh, you know, yours. And the best way to do that is, you know, a handy little trick where you can actually just cat the device. So cat touch screen zero. So I'm just you know, reading this file output. And then if I touch the screen, you can see all this sort of binary data that's being printed out onto the console. So, you know, that right there tells me that there's, there's data flowing out of it. And it's a pretty good clue that this is going to be the device. You know, you could go through and validate the other ones just to be sure. 
you know, so if I were to do cat event zero and hit enter, we don't see anything when I'm touching the screen right now. Um, so, you know, that's a pretty good, pretty good bet that that's outputting the data that we need. So if we wanted to leverage that, all you'd need to do is add that as a parameter to the engine options. So going back there, user rank, yeah, storyboard, CP. This is where you can go through, add your parameter here. And again, all the different options for the engine and the configurations are available in our docs. But OMT dev. So dash O simply is saying, you know, this is a, a plugin object. Um, the name after that, MT dev, obviously mapping to the plugin itself. And this is where I can say device equals, and we simply pass in the path to the device. So slash dev input touch screen zero. And if this was a system that we weren't running Wayland, that's what I'd need to add to hook up the, the touch input. For TS lib, there are a few different options with TS lib. Sometimes you can choose to export some environment variables where you know, the TSLib system will have a configuration file you can export, or, um, you know, there's a certain place where there's a, a point called pointer cal file that will live on your system that if it's in that place, our plugin will read it and, and load it up. But the documentation for that, if you're using TSLib, is available in our, on our help center on the website, or, you know, in our installation directory, we also have a, um, PDF the documentation that you could look it up there as well. So, you know, those are some of the main main things you need to understand for, for running and configuring on, on the system. You know, a, a pretty good, um, you know, test if you're going through and you're, you're dropping a runtime on, you know, you can just try and, you know, run it from the terminal. So if I were to, you know, quit that, and you know, I've caught, so let's say I've SCP copied my, my runtime on, so under runtime, go into the Linux directory. You know, we could then, you know, take the path for this. So if I do WD, I can copy that. Go up one, so we have a little clear terminal here. And I can export some of these paths. So, um, you know, this is where I can say export LD library export path equals paste that in slash lib. And if I that again and just write the environment variable there. You can see I've exported that library path here. Underscore lib. Do the same same thing for sb underscore plugins. And for this, generally again, so I mentioned uh, an SSH connection is a little bit easier to see what see what your uh, doing here. There we go. Plugins. And you can see now our, um, whoops, I've overwrite, overwritten it, so I'll just quickly fix that. Sorry about that. So lib. All the way back. Perfect. And now we see we have our SB underscore plugins. So since we've exported both of those, you know, the first thing you'll do is you'll try and execute the, the runtime. So this is where I'll I'll jump back into the runtime directory and jump into the bin here. So you can see here, this is where the SV engine runtime is. So if I were to um, dot slash SV engine, 
and hit enter, you should see this usage message coming up and basically saying pass in the um, you know, engine options and a path to the um, application you've exported. So we can quickly do that here now. Again, I'm on the Weston Wayland configuration. So this is going to be looking for another uh, environment variable there, the XDG information. But you know, if it does fail, it'll give us some diagnostic information around that. But you know, it's super easy to then to um, user crank apps OpenGL. And it's actually running, so I'll just go ahead and I will switch this over. Um, but I didn't add any verbosity here, so that's why you can't uh, you can't see any output. But if I just kill that and do that there, this is where perfect. We can see the the output verbosity. If I touch some elements, you can see the events coming through, you know, triggering the uh, the animations, content like that. I'll just switch over to webcam just so you guys can see what I'm seeing again. And that's usually the first step you want to do. So, you know, it doesn't take very much. Export your runtime on, export an application onto your board, and then launch it. So again, exporting the two environment variables, the SB underscore plugins and LD underscore library path, and, you know, you can execute the binary. From there, that's where you'll configure things. So like you'll You'll look for your touch device, as we saw, so catting the devices under slash dev slash um, input, as well as, um, you know, passing that in. So creating a, a launch script is usually helpful, and that's where you can start building up different options. Uh, you could even be a little bit more creative and query for different devices, so maybe it's a, a more genericized one. But, um, you know, that sort of goes down how you want to uh, configure your your, uh, your shell script, so there's a lot of different options there, and you know, depending on your comfort in, in bash scripting, you can really do a lot of different things. The final thing I might want to just call out is, you know, once you're happy with your application and it runs well and you, you're testing it, you want it to auto boot. So you don't necessarily want to have to jump onto the terminal every time you put up the board and uh, execute your script or export the environment variables again. So Close that down. You can see what we saw there. Close that off. And on our boards, we use system D to launch a service. So there's a couple different ways you can do that. Uh, on some of the older Linux system configurations, there would also be the uh, rc.d uh, scripts, and they would be found under slash etc in it d where you'd find a directory that would sort of be like rc um, zero through six so again the different uh, launch uh, states of your system but in our case with uh, system system d you can specify a service and dependencies so um, in our case when we launch the board it automatically calls a script that we have under um, etc in it d and you can see here there's something called storyboard launcher so if i cat that out for you helps if i put the script in there you can see here in that script we've got a start function we also have a stop function so you can specify commands into that and basically the minimum you're going to need for a service is starting and stopping. Uh, sometimes it might be helpful to throw in a, uh, you know, a restart command so you could you know, basically kill and reboot it. But all that's happening here is, you know, we're doing a few board specific things. So again, disabling cursor blank um, and uh, screen blanking. We also have a few environment variables that we're reading in our applications. But again, the main thing is, you know, we're calling out our runtime directory mapping the engine as well as you know SB plugins and the LD library path. So again, exposing the libs and the plugins that come with the runtime. Then specify our options 
And in this case, you know, we're, we start up, we, we trigger the launcher app and, um, and we call it. So this gets called on boot. So if ever you're, you know, playing around with one of, the, one of our demo images, this is where you can, you know, start and stop them. So on the system, there's a system control. So that's the main command uh, that you can run. You know, lots of different options around there. This just basically prints out, you know, all the different services running and their dependencies. And, you know, there's a whole series of information and, you know, reading you can do on system D in and of itself. But if you're ever curious about it, that's, you know, the first thing you can do. So if you run system control, you can then specify a command. So in our case, we can say start and then storyboard dot service. And that's running the storyboard service that's uh, mapped into uh, system D, you know, so that launched our application again. And if we were to just run, you know, the system control command, and if I were to pipe that to rep and search for storyboard, you can see that you know, our service is, is running. So you can see here, you know, loaded, active, running in it, launch storyboard service. You can also use the stop command to tear it down. And that uh, tore the system down as well. So I'll just quickly click on the webcam for one last view so you can see what's going on there. Perfect, so if we start the service, you can see we've launched our application. You know, I can touch all my elements. I can jump into sub apps just like normal. So again, we've got our nice robot arm with some animations here. Jump back to the other one. And then if I go through and stop it, that kills the service as well. So that happens on boot, and you know we've configured that in a way that we're waiting for the, uh, the Westin service to come up as well. So that's sort of the, the main way that we set up our systems. And if you play around with some of our demo images, which you know are definitely a great place to start, that's um, what I would suggest doing as we as we go forward. So that kind of brings me you know to the end of you know this configuring your system for. Um, your, your apps for running on Linux. Obviously, there's you know a lot more to um, talk about in this case. So you know it could be down to you know how you configure your your system image and, and building your Yocto recipes. You know, so there's a lot of information that comes um, from the hardware vendors about how they do that, how they build up their system images. And we generally defer to uh, their recommendations in that case, but you can certainly go down that path as well. And, um, you know, if you're doing something specific on your end, you might have other, um, other uh, you know, special constraints that you need to follow as well. So if ever you don't have, you know, don't necessarily know the answer to your questions or you're having trouble, you can always reach out to support at cranksoftware.com or take a peek in our docs or our help center and we'll be, you know, happy to help put you in the right direction. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and open it up to some questions here. I see some some commentary in the chat, and some of the key takeaways. This is where you know always visit our help center as you know first first go if you're having issues. You know we're we're pretty familiar with a bunch of different embedded systems, uh, and a bunch of different uh, embedded uh, silicon vendors as well. So we can probably help point you in the right direction. Um, or you know, if it's a more technical problem, then we can we can tell you who the best person to reach out to or best uh, source of avenue might be. And uh, if you guys have any questions, you know, this is where you know open the open the field up to you. Moment, but really appreciate your time today. So thank you for uh, tuning in, and um, I'll definitely definitely happy to have you. So check out uh, the free trial, cranksoftware.com. You can download the full version of Storyboard. And from there, you can uh, you know, do everything you saw today, as well as build up, develop your applications, and then start playing around on your embedded hardware. So again, my name is Nick Schultz. 
thanks a lot for your, for your time today and um, look forward to chatting to you guys next time.